Okay, this is our final day of class and we will be uh, reviewing the study guide for the final. The final is going to be on Monday. The Zoom synchronous final will be Monday from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. We have the absolute first slot. So the final will be open for two hours and it will open at 8 a.m. If you do, I will be here on Zoom. If you want to join us on Zoom, that would be excellent. And if you don't want to join us on Zoom, you will have a certain amount of time Anytime you open the final, it will be a two hour block. Uh, and I will have a due date of, you, you can't change the final time, but if you, op I can't make it any earlier and, but I will have a due date of that night so that you actually must complete it by Monday night. So I would recommend coming in and getting it done. It will be a multiple choice, just a question, just like we did with our midterm. And it will be, uh, you'll be able to find out your score pretty much right after your, um, after you take your final. There will be a couple of questions that will be short answer. So just letting you know that, let's go to looking for the study guide. Okay. Are you, are you seeing the modules now? Or are you still seeing announcements? If I changed my pages, can you see this or do you see just the announcements? Um, I see that and I think you were on the modules as well. Okay, all right, thanks. Just the reason why I ask you is because Um, I know that sometimes when you're screen sharing, you have a certain way that you can actually uh, look at things and you can't shift between screens. So that's why I asked that question. And I should have had this prepared beforehand. So here we are on week 13, you'll have a final reflection and here's our final exam study guide. This is going to be a final reflection will be a download, which you click on this to download it. You can then copy it into a Word document, you don't have to print it. And or you can, uh, then you can fill in the questions and then you can upload it on to um, back into this assignment page. It's open until December the 9th, which is Wednesday at midnight. So it's just a series of questions. Each question is worth 10 points and it's short answer. So on the student show, I completed a concept collage, yes or no, circle one, and what did that exercise teach you? So you're just filling those things in. And I will pick one of those, uh, one of these questions to be a discussion question as I have been remiss and not uh, put the questions in. I think. So is the final reflection our final exam? No, that's just okay. just a written thing so that I have feedback for the class. Okay, got it. But I'm giving you points for it, so you'll do it. Sweet. <laughs> and I'm giving you I'm giving you a hundred points. I want I really want to know. I really want to know because this class is is. Um, you know, it's really the first time it's been fully online. And so if I, uh, next semester, I will not be teaching this class at all. So if I have to teach it again in the fall and I don't know, I'm really hoping that in the fall, we will be in person because I think it's actually safer to be for, I think it's really particularly for elementary and younger students, it's safer to be in person than it is to be roaming around or doing whatever. I mean, Here's my sister works with um, English as a second language and bilingual and migrant workers and you know and if you have parents who can one of them can stay home or they have tutors or you can go to a place like there's a remote learning center that they have people who will kind of supervise you as you're doing your zoom you're not going to get behind but other kids they're going to be this whole year is going to be a big zero. And when you're not moving forward, you're moving backwards because they lose their language skills. 
you learn, they have even documented that over summer, students um, lose a lot of the knowledge and a lot of the routine that they built during the school year. And that's one reason why in LA, there's several schools that are year round. They take a two week break and they come back or they take a three week break at Christmas and they come back and they, and they are technically year round because it is better for your brain to have that kind of repetition. Um, one of the other uh, new modes of thought is that instead of doing this kind of learning, you would have basically block learning so that for six weeks, all you would do would be the costume construction class. And then the next six weeks you do your English class or the next six weeks, because we actually have a 16 week um, semester. So maybe it would be like five weeks, five weeks, five weeks, and you could you would be able to still get your number of courses. And, but you would do intense courses. So maybe you'd meet this course every day and that that has proved to be for many people it's a better way to learn because they're not distracted with a bunch of other classes and they just focus on one thing so there's a lot of different learning techniques that we're trying to figure out in this new environment that's really interesting the six week well this summer i taught a summer school class that was exactly that six weeks and it was a fully academic theater appreciation class and you know what they were really engaged it was a pretty robust and um, I had, I think, 29 students in it and they and pretty much people did a great job. So they showed up, they had, we had a lot of different assignments we did in person, they had to do rehearsals, they had to do other things together. So, okay. Um, I'm just making a note so that uh, I could, I'm trying to figure out different student interaction. Okay, so final exam study guide, identify the following tools by site. So if I put a picture in there, you can see this tool and explain the use. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the um, computer over and you should be able to note what these things are. So who would like to take uh, the first group of items and discuss it? Victoria, you want to talk about that? What are scissors? Am, am I just describing or what am I doing? What are, just talk about scissors. What kind of scissors have you been exposed to in this class? Um, fabric scissors. And? Um, like, I don't know if they're called shear cutters. So we use, we use fabric scissors and those are used for fabric only. You have those small nippers that, are, that I, you've seen me use on the machine that are for thread only. And we have the other category of scissors that we have is craft scissors because you never want to have your scissors that cut your fabric also cut paper. Paper dulls scissors significantly. So if we're gonna cut patterns or even sometimes if I'm cutting certain kinds of interfacing, I will be cutting that with a craft scissor instead of with my fabric scissors. So shears are just another word for scissor and sometimes it refers to a longer blade. Um, and uh, I'm just wondering if the better thing to do is for me to have the study guide up and then I can show you items, what do you think? Yeah, that sounds good. Would that would you like that, Cara? Yeah, I think that would for this part anyway. Okay, let me yeah. start this share. Let me go over to my standing position and then I will I will open this screen up on my and just make my I'll have two screens up. So that'll work. And that way I can I can uh, track. And you guys could also track it by having two and looking at your study guide. I mean, it's, it'll be, we'll just go straight down the study guide. So let me just grab this and move over. I was just, I've never done it online. So trying to figure out how to do it is interesting. Thank you. 
Okay. I'm going to move this over and plug into another source so that I'm closer to the danger, danger of moving my computer while I'm on different kinds of boxes, etc. Okay. All right, very good. Let's um, let me go to making a better screen. Wait a minute. Okay. Okay. So We have scissors. Our scissors that are used for fabric always have a fabric blade, a fabric piece of fabric on them so that it's very clear. And the blade, you know, can be slightly serrated, but it is very sharp and it is intended to cut all the way to the point. So they tend to have a very good crisp point. And these tend to be flat so that we can cut along the table craft scissors. Well, okay, this is a rotary cutter. So this is, um, you want to expose the blade. Let me just show you how to do that. This is different than what I'm used to. Where you pull, you slide it down. Let's see. Okay. So the rotary color, this is the blade that cuts and you cut like this along the edge of your pattern. So were I to do that here on the table, I would cut along the edge of my pattern like this. Okay, and that would give me a cut and that would be very secure. And the other kind of scissors that we have are craft scissors. Typically, they're, um, they, ca they can look exactly the same. This is fabric scissors. If they have a piece of fabric, they're fabric. And if they have craft, we tend to label them craft. But they are tend to be plastic. And scissors that people have left behind or things that have glue on them, as you can see. So that would be a different kind of scissor. OK. The next thing we have um, is seam ripper. Okay, seam ripper. Characterized by a blade right here in the center, a point and usually a ball so that you can pick out a thread and as you push it, you will slice it. Now this is something, this is very sharp. You don't wanna do a buttonhole with this because you could slice the entire piece with it. So that's a seam ripper, use them judiciously. Pins, push pins, uh, safety pins, silk pins. So let's talk about those. So we use silk pins, silk, these are, this is a one and three quarter inch pin with a head on it, okay? This is not a needle, a needle, a needle has an eye at one end. So this is one and three quarter inch. The previous uh, supervisor felt that this was the best kind of pin and it used, worked very well with silk and all kinds of weight of fabric. Now this is a magnetic pin holder, which is nice for holding pins. It is, however, uh, it can, we think, ruin the integrity of the pin by weakening it with the magnetic field. There are uh, T-pins, which we use for wigs, and this then secures the wig to a head form. You can see that the pin is much bigger. Let me just give you a comparison. And it is a much more blunt instrument on the end because it's not going into a tightly woven fabric. So you can see the two weights are very significantly different there. 
Okay, and then a safety pin is one that has a top on it that provides a shield, a safety shield, so that the exposed part of the pin is all smooth and is not going to poke anyone. So when we do fittings, we typically put in a safety pin. Also, safety pins are unlikely to fall out in transport. So if we take our garments to, at the very minimum, from the fitting area into the costume shop, we're not going to lose a pin or lose a fitting point. So that's very important. And then a push pin. Push pin is a pin that has a head. So it is a very specifically shaped and length pin so that when we need to use it for a pattern, we can stick that right into our table. We have a cork top table and that will secure it and we can cut around it. You know, people use these for bulletin boards and stuff. I personally like the metal head pin and that is very durable and secure so that we can use them over and over. So if we have a pattern, we use it without seam allowance and then we can add seam allowance. We push the pin in. If we add seam allowance to that, then you can cut around it without having to remove the pin. Then you pull your pins out and it's very quick, much more quick than the, um, much more quick than having to unpin the paper pattern and pin it back in. Okay. Uh, so we use that one and three quarter inch silk pin. Measuring tape, we have the, we generally use the flexible measuring tape. We'll talk about all kinds of things that it has inches and centimeters. So you can see both inches and centimeters on this. And I'll just show you the two inch. So if you look at the two inch, because we often have international students and they're working with centimeters. So that would be approximately five centimeters. Or when you work in Europe, suddenly, you know, if you're looking at a waist of a 32, and I'm getting measurements for guys when we did all the Dockers commercials, so then they would say their waist is 81, right? And that would be, that'd be like, wow, the waist is 81. That's very interesting. And then I realized, of course, it's all in centimeters. So seam gauge, one of our very excellent measuring devices that we've used a lot. Anybody want to take that on as a discussion point? So I would say it's a six inch ruler that has a slider so that you can measure a very specific increment. So if I want to measure one inch, here I am right here. And then I can, uh, I can mark very clearly what this looks like. And this indicator is very nice. I'm going to pause for one second. Okay, so this is called the seam gauge. And it is great. So for example, I can mark the edge of my pattern. And if I'm gonna do a 5 8 inch uh, seam allowance, I can quickly mark. We use this to uh, mark against the needle to find out when where the 5 8 inch was. Okay, pin cushion. Now we use that magnetic, but we do have a couple of pin cushions which you can secure your pins by point into a pin cushion. The tomato is very popular. And also it is commonly thought that this thing is some kind of grit, so it's a sharpener. I'm not really sure if it works, but that's what that little, oh, I never knew that. That little strawberry is for. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So a pin cushion, a place to carry to, you know, keep your pins. There's also the wrist. Lots of people love the wrist pin cushion so that if they're working with something, they can just keep, they can pull their pins out and put them in here. We also have a magnetic strip on our sewing machine so that you can actually just put your, your pins on your, on the magnetic strip. So that works very, very well. So, okay. Uh, then we have adhesives. White glue is a water soluble white glue. Barge cement we've talked about is a, is a two, um, like an AB, you paint both sides and you stick it together and then you hammer it. That's what we typically put rubber soles onto shoes with. It is used for shoemaking. 
It is used in leather work and it is a really terrific um, adhesive, but it has high, uh, what is that called? Something, vol, V-O-L. But it is very, um, you need to have extremely good ventilation to be able to use it. Um, some of these products that were like large cement and shellac were reasons why they were called the Mad Hatter because the fumes actually made them go crazy after a period of time. Hot melt glue and glue gun. Uh, we've talked about that. Do you guys need to see one? No. no. So that's plastic and it is really a, um, it's really uh, good for certain applications and not for others. So if you're doing plastic to plastic, it works well. If you're putting hot melt onto something like a rigid surface, like a ceramic or something or a fabric, it can just peel right off. I never wanna have hot melt glue on a straw hat because it will go into the straw and then the straw is ruined forever or a felt hat, you can't get it off. So French curve, if we go to our drafting tools, you can see that I have drafting tools right here. So this is the French curve that I showed you. That, oh, let's see, that's not here. I'll put it in front of this. So you can see it. And this creates the perfect neck hole, the arm's eye, and it creates the shape of the body. So that's, there's all kinds of French curves. Each one of these is a French curve. And you can, it just helps standardize the shape so that when you're working with a curve, you can actually get a smooth edge instead of, uh, you know, a bunch of, of joined, if you do a dot system, and then you'd be joining some straight edges. So these are French curves used for doing arms, eye, neck holes, and any curved portion of the body. We even use it for some of the darts that I showed you when, after you pin the dart in, then you need to have the French curve to shape the dart to take the fabric out in the right way. And that, that actually takes the fabric out and creates a bias. So the see-through ruler is something that we use a lot because then you can look through and mark, right? We use that many, many times in class. And then the L square is something that we used when I did the measurements and I sat on the table and we took the the rise, which is the distance from the table to the waist. So that's the straight edge that you'd have. I'm just gonna get one. So this is the, this is the L curve. The great thing about it is it gives you a fully 90 degree and then 45 would be your bias. Now these are listed in your costume handbook, your, your tech costume technician handbook. So I'm just gonna show you, there's pictures of everything. When it talks about equipment, the costume shop, setting up the workspace, right? We've done all these things. Just a second, I'm gonna get you to the pictures of the equipment so that you know what they are and they talk about adhesives and everything. So here's the here's pictures of sewing machines, lists of sewing machines, uh, pictures of racks, pictures of ironing tools. We're gonna go through those, pressing aids. Here's the hand stitching supplies section. They identify each one of those things. So you can look at uh, tracing wheels and measuring devices, right? Uh, mannequins, how mannequins are stored. So these are all in your textbook, which is mandatory. So I think it's a good, it's also a place where you can review where things are. So this is your L square. What are some marking tools? If we are gonna make a pattern from, uh, or we're even going to use our pattern to um, cut a garment, we're going to need some marking tools. So Taylor's chalk. There's two kinds of Taylor's chalk, the waxy chalk and the dry chalk. Both of them work. This one basically brushes off. This one you have to iron out. And then we have marking pencils. Wow, I don't know why that's in there.
So this is a marking marker and it will actually then you can erase it. Here's an eraser for it. And here's a marking pencil. And then we also use the, just the graphite pencil. So, you know, there's, you, you want, generally want to use something that you can see on your fabric. And we did that when we made our mask so that you could see where your um, pleats were and also where the front of the mask was. Tracing wheel and paper. I showed you some tracing wheels, but remember this is the mini pizza cutter. Tracing paper is a waxy surface on top of a piece of paper. This is the wax surface. This is the back of it so that I can trace along this and make a line. Let me show you how that works. So we're going to come down here. And I showed you this when we worked with our pattern day. So were this piece of fabric a piece of cloth, I would trace along this to mark something. And then I would have this series of dots. Right? And that's a great way to see what you might need to transfer from a pattern or from a fitting and a mock-up of something into, an, into a paper pattern and then into an actual garment so that it's a very clear way that you can see things. And your um, stitching line on your understitching was marked in that exact same way with tracing wheel and paper. So hand sewing supplies. What is our primary implement for hand sewing? Needle and thread. Yep. So we have a, a wide variety of needles. This is, this is a huge variety of different kinds of needles, whether you're going to do, the two major kinds are sharps and betweens, but there's also tailoring needles. There are darning needles. There are, let's take a look at this needle kit for bags, leather, clothing, and darning. And you can see that even in there, there's a wide variety of needles. Now, interestingly, look, this was a, this was a freebie that Farmers Insurance Group used to give. So, of course, now no one sews, so they would definitely not do it. There's a curved needle, which is used for upholstery and trying to get hard things going around a corner. So there's a wide variety of needles that are very, very helpful here. Generally, we tend to work with betweens or sharps, which are small. We have um, beeswax to help the thread cooperate. Remember, this coats the thread. We also have two different kinds of thread. We can work with the regular machine thread. We worked with silamide, which is our hand sewing thread that is pre-cut and pre-waxed. Right, and it's very cooperative. So uh, if you're in person, you get to see this wonderful waxed, it's called wax skein or silamide thread, which is lovely. Otherwise you can wax your thread and it really works well. So that the thread itself has a, has a texture to it and you run that. Remember thread, un, thread is apply. P-L-Y, so it has more than one yarn in it. And it's twisted together in a certain way. And I'm gonna untwist this so you can see the different ply. Okay. So there's the very end of this thread. See those ply, how it goes together, even though this is a very narrow thread. And you want to make sure that you're sewing along that edge. It's like hair, hair has the hair shaft has, has little hairs that go in a certain direction or scales. Okay. We also, uh, the silamide is the tailor's thread. And then if you're using a number of, um, if you're gonna be hand sewing a lot, you may want to invest in a thimble so that you can push the back end of your needle without your needle going through your finger. I know that I've 
I, it took me a while to get used to using thimble, but once, if you're doing a lot of hand sewing, a thimble, it really saves your hand. So that's something. And those can be leather, they can be, uh, they don't have to have a, a top on them. There's a lot of different kinds of thimbles that you can find. So measuring again, we have the see-through ruler. We have the flexible tape, which I showed you. We have the metal tape. This happens to be a 45 inch metal straight edge. A yardstick is 36, right, to here. A yardstick is just 36 inches, but this happens to be the extra quarter of a yard. So it's a nice long piece that we can use. And we even have a 60. So these are really great tools because metal does not warp. The problem with a wooden yardstick is a, um, a wooden yardstick can actually change shape. And as you draw along it significantly, you can actually erode the edge. So you'd have to do a lot of sewing for that. Okay, millinery supplies. Let me uh, come back to that and I'll take you into the other room. Um, because we, we had our head block, our styrofoam wig block, the balsa block, the hat block, T-pins, which I've talked about, millinery wire, buckram, which is the, the mesh fabric that is water soluble so that it, we could shape it. Remember, I shaped that over the head. It's one of our very first classes. Uh, and also wool felt. So do you have questions on the millinery supplies? Because I'll make a note and I can show you those things that you have questions on. You kind of remember what those are? Okay. I do. Yes. Okay, let's go to fasteners. So, of course, we have our, I'll show you our fastener bank, which is kind of cool since we're here. So, this is our fastener bank. This would be hook. right? Hook and bar. This is what we put on. This is our in our group. But these are all the hooks and all the snaps and they come in sizes from double zero to whopper. So we work with sometimes very, very large snaps and they really can hold things together. Look how big these are. And they really, if we're doing, if we need to do a quick change, sometimes this is a better way to make it secure. And then we don't hear that horrible rip of the Velcro. So we have a quite a wide variety of fasteners and we have a wide variety of buttons just next door to that. We have two different button banks. This is one of them. So you can see they're all organized by color and by shape. So whether we have a sew through button, a shank button, a covered button, you know, all those kinds, those are also listed on the Canvas site. Um, Velcro, you guys have a sample of Velcro that you used and zippers, which I'm wearing a zipper today. So this is a center closed zipper and it zips up at the bottom. and it has a pull tab, but it's a pretty nice finish because you don't see the zipper teeth. That's the thing that I really don't like. I don't like this big exposed thing. When manufacturers do that, it's because it's cheap and it's faster. So this happens to be a very enclosed zipper, which is nice. So you don't see the zipper teeth, but it's cheaper. So people are doing what's cheap. Okay, uh, pressing. Now we have an ironing board and we have an ironing table. And this is our ironing table right here. So it's padded, multiple layers of padding here, covered with muslin and white so that we can see it. We have a ironing uh, pressing aids such as the tailoring ham and it's called that because it looks like a ham. This part is wool, this part is linen, and this is a shaped piece so that you can do a shaped, you can press a shaped dart 
over this, even a hip dart, a bus dart. We have a tube, another kind of tailor's ham, and we have a sleeve board so that if you have a narrow piece of fabric, you can put it on top of here or here. So if I need to press a jacket like this one, because you know, only in sportswear should you have a crease in your shirt. So if you're pressing a jacket sleeve, you want to be able to pull that over this sleeve board and press so that you do not get a, um, a crease in your sleeve. Short sleeve sportswear shirts and uh, uniforms are what should have a crease in them. So this is different shapes for different sleeves. If you have a bigger sleeve, you can use this one for sure. And we have an, another a variety of things, the needle board, which allows us to iron with uh, the nap. If you put, if you have corduroy or velvet, you put the nap on this and it lifts that up. You can see how this is actually a series of really sharp things so that you don't crush that very uh, fluffy, thick surface that is gives you that luxurious look. And this is a, uh, this is a point turner. You can iron a, uh, you can iron a seam on this and then the edges of the seam do not imprint on your fabric. This is a clapper. And what this is used for is to beat down thick seams. So when you're tailoring something like this as a wool jacket, you actually put this onto your surface and you beat it. One other thing that I'm gonna show you that's kind of a cool device. I don't think I can get my jacket on this mannequin. She's too big. Let's see if I can, oh, maybe I could just put it on here. So uh, I wanted to show you the sleeve stretchers. And to create a great sleeve shape, you can use a series of sleeve stretchers, which are these cool item. And note, look how this looks just like the sleeve shape. So I can just slide this up into my sleeve. And that will stretch it out so that I can get a really nice crisp sleeve Very nice, and I can then steam that in place, allow the steam to evaporate and release. And when it's cool, I take this out and I have an excellent, nicely pressed sleeve shape. So even doing it for a few seconds uh, helped my jacket out a little. And then we have a steamer. So I showed you the big Jiffy steamer that we used with the, uh, when we did millinery. And we used that to steam the wool. You also can use it to steam this. You can even use a steam iron. And these are our industrial irons. They don't sit on their sole plate. They, they sit on their sole plate, not on their heel. And you can even use this and shoot steam. And even a domestic iron will shoot steam. So you can use all of those devices to create steam. Steam is very, very valuable. Um, I, along with the uh, draping, you want to know that draping is working with a mannequin. And we're fortunate and then we have mannequins of all sizes. This one is a 22. So we measure them and put their measurements on the back neck as well as on their front. We cover them because the sun will destroy the cloth. and will rot the shoulders out and so will moisture. So, and then we put their sizes on the front too so that when we're looking quickly, we can see, oh, I need something that has this size bust and it's very helpful. Again, most of the things we do are to create efficiency so that we can get, we're working with a lot of different moving parts. So all your supplies are on page 22 to 32. So know the parts of your sewing machine. I'll just sit down at a machine and we can review those. 
and the serger. So let's talk about, you remember what the serger is? The overlock machine, the one that, that both cuts and stitches. So let's go to that machine. So most machines have, this is set up to work, a thread post, a thread guide, the thread, uh, and then we might as well talk about threading. You will need to know some about threading. So it travels to a thread guide. It comes down through a tension plate, under a thread guide, up through the take-up lever. So the take-up lever is the thing that holds the thread in the furthest upright position and travels down through a thread guide and then it threads. So this is the thread post, thread guide, thread guide, thread guide, tension plates, take up lever. Okay, presser foot. And in here we have feed dog. All right, the feed dog is here and that can go up and down. Now you see them down, now you can see them up. Let me move this so that you can see them up. There we go, they come back up. And why would you want them in the down position? Well, if you need to move something around to uh, darn, you could have, you can get your presser, almost all machines have the app ability to re get the presser feet out of the way. But these are the things that grab your fabric and make your fabric travel, okay? A series of lines for measurement. Here's the pin catcher, it's magnetic. And then our different uh, stitch width device, needle position, this is a buttonhole device, stitch length. So stitch width, needle position, stitch length. This is the whether the feed dog are up or down based on darning or not. And your wheel, your hand wheel that helps you it start your machine. You can also on your stitch length go backwards. So those are some of your um, things that you need on your sewing machine. And let's look at the serger. So we have both three thread and four thread. They just uh, give you a little bit of extra security. And I'll just, just there, I'll just show you the three thread. So we call it overlock, the overlock machine. And it's, it is, a, has three different threads. You can see one, two, and three. And this is the thread guide, the spools are on the back. Comes down, there's a very complex threading device. And it comes through here. This is the fabric, fabric catcher. Each of these comes through a thread guide, is threaded through, through a tension device. Each of these are tension devices, another thread guide. And you can see the very complex threading pattern on the inside. So each of these has a colored button and you could actually thread them, but you really need a lot of practice to be able to get all these threaded correctly. The most important thing about this machine is to note that there is a blade right here that cuts and that this machine actually encloses the thread over the raw edge. So it cuts a raw edge and then beyond that, it encloses the thread using those three threads in a circular fashion to finish the fabric, okay? But it's a pretty wild machine in there. <laughs> so do you change the color of thread or do you oh, tend yeah. to keep, you do? And you can thread through all there? Here's the uh, finish. Yeah, you, we, you, what you do is, one of the easiest things to do for any machine is you can clip your thread, even on your domestic machine and put your new spool on and tie a knot. And if you very carefully pull it through, on this one you would run the foot, you can uh, run your new thread through your machine. You can do oh, that on your domestic machine as well. That's magic. Yeah, it is magic. I mean, that's a, something that's really fun. I actually need to, I need to talk to Wally for one second because I realize these machines 
wow, they have a lot of oil underneath. I moved this, this overlock and there's a puddle of oil. So we're gonna have to clean that up. I'll just make a note for him. Okay, so those are our major piece of equipment. The, those are our major pieces of equipment, the sewing machine, the overlock or serger and the ironing equipment, okay? So what do you need for fittings? Uh, you need your items and you need the job, the people who are going to help you with the fitting. Let me get the board out for that. Hey, Wally. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, talk about, um, let me move this out because it's too hard for me to get in there. Okay, so you guys, who needs to be in the fitting? The talent. Yes. That's wrong, wrong side. That is correct. The talent or the actor. Who else? The costume supervisor. Yes. What does the costume supervisor do? Make sure like all the hem seams and uh, that kind of stuff is all like finished yeah they can do that they also are let me see if i can do something here okay right they are the person who prioritizes the work right they prioritize the work so okay here's the actor they have to wear the garment this person sees the garment and then thinks about how that's gonna work in the shop. Usually you have a cutter draper or a cutter fitter draper. This, the person who makes the pattern, if you're going to do a pattern, generally comes in to see how successful they have been. And I use these measurements, I'm making the shape, the costume designer is there so that they can see, is this, pattern on this body working the way that they thought it would. And then ideal is if you have a note taker, someone to take notes. So, you know, that's a lot of intensity. The costume supervisor also photos the fitting so that we can then show that to the director. And sometimes I show actors to show they can see what the rest of the show is looking like so they can see where they fit in. If an actor is insecure about their body and insecure about the costume that they're wearing, then sometimes it helps them to be able to see what happens with that. And then you need to know what each one of these people does, their job description, their title, and what they do. So costume shop personnel, title and job descriptions, which is the thing you did for your costume crew handbook, is something that you need to know for this. And also the backstage people. Okay, fabric identification. Let's look at what that is. Uh, know the difference between a natural and synthetic fiber. Um, if we were in person, I would be putting a piece of fabric on a, on a paper as a number and you would have to feel it and say, this is a cotton, this is a wool, this is a linen and describe what that is. Is it a cellulosic or protein fiber? And so we'll do something different for this particular application. But you need to be able to identify by fiber, common name, and the weave. So let's talk about that. So this one was particularly. So if I hold up something, if I give you a piece of fabric, you should be able to identify it as a plain weave, even if I am 
putting it on a test, you should be able to look at it and see, okay, this is a plain weave, okay? So you should be able to do that for muslin, right? Here's our muslins. Denim, denim is our twill, corduroy. I'll get that out. Let me show you those. Remember the twill weave has a strong diagonal. Here's our strong diagonal. And denim, which is two color, has that very strong diagonal. So you can actually see if it's a diagonal, like you can see this, that's a twill weave. If you see that strong diagonal, it's a twill weave, okay? If you see it chevroning together, and I'm not sure, can you see this piece very well? There you go. If you see it chevroning together, you know that that is a herringbone. See how it makes a V shape. And that has a two color V shape. So there's, uh, there's that, where is our, you should be able to identify corduroy, which has an extra loft to it. So it's ribbed. Plain knit, but has a depth. And this is one, one thing that you would want to iron with the needle board so that you don't crush that surface down. So that was something that was very um, important. Be able to identify the, the plain weave, the satin weave and the twill weave by weave. So what's the characteristics of the plain weave? If you had to describe that, what would you say? Super easy. It's our easiest weave pattern. Who wants to take it? Is it softer? Is it like cotton? Well, oh, no. talk about this. If you want to describe the weave pattern, it would be over, under, over, under, over one, under one, over one, under one, over one. That's, that's plain weave. So that is, that is the simplest way to think about it. Twill weave is <laughs> characterized by the diagonal. And satin weave, is characterized by the long float threads, very long exposed threads. And remember those long float threads, that's hard to say. <laughs> the long float threads are why you get, when you have satin, you get a shiny surface because they longer, un longer exposed threads reflect light, okay? Be sure you understand the straight of grain. Mm -hmm and the bias. So you know warp and weft. So the point of the bias, remember, is that it stretches. Here's my straight of grain on my bias. It looks at it and this is stretchy. So you want to know that and the here's my image of it. The lengthwise grain, the cross grain here, and the bias at a 45 degree angle. That is what determines the bias. Remember, a woven is interlocking threads at 90 degrees, and the bias is what gives us the stretch. The selvage is the finished edge, and you have that in your um, sewing bag. Everyone got a selvage edge on their numbered pat on their numbered piece. So let me see. Wally, do we have any of the numbered pieces here? So you have a cut edge, a finished edge, and you have your bias with your number here marked. And the bias characteristic is stretches. Lengthwise stretches less, crosswise stretches a teeny bit, and bias stretches the most. If you put the crosswise grain to the lengthwise grain, 
like this, you get the maximum bias and you're going to get exactly a 45 degree angle. And you will get lengthwise, crosswise, and 45 at the stretch. Okay. So know the following terms, drape the pattern, which I talked about, which is you work with the mannequin and cloth. Draft the pattern, you're working with a pencil and a, usually a see-through ruler, and you're working with paper flat on the table. The drafting the pattern is the flat on the table. And the commercial pattern, which you each have, the commercial pattern handout, and you have a commercial pattern that has been given to you. So you know what the commercial pattern has an instruction, an instruction portion that tells you cutting instructions, layout instructions, sewing instructions, and then it has the actual pattern itself in the tissue paper. Okay, basics dye information from our dyeing day. How to paste up, put the, put the boiling water into the dye paste. Remember you're wearing protection, safety, uh, sometimes goggles, definitely a mask, definitely gloves. The dry dye goes into the cup. You pour the hot water in a small amount at a time. So you paste it up and you get all of the granules of salt dissolved so that then you can use that. Then you pour that through a sieve that goes into a simmering pot so that that will allow, and then it's agitated so that you can put your wet fabric in and your color will be uniform throughout. The important thing is that you have the maximum, you have enough water that your fabric can move freely through the entire dye bath. Remember dye has three components. So there's the actual dye media, the color media, So that is the dye. The medium where the dye is suspended and then the binder and our dye used salt. Okay, so the salt is what activated the dye so that it could be absorbed into the fiber. The medium is where the dye was suspended and that the, the color itself goes into the fabric. Here's our actually our sample that we dyed right here. The color goes into the fabric. It is, does not go into the water. This, the dye is suspended in the medium, which is water, but it is absorbed not by the water, but by the fiber, okay? So that's what we did in our dyeing day and also a union or household dye, which is RIT, which we use, can be used on a wide variety of fibers. We talked about that. This is cellulosic, this is muslin, so it's cotton. A cellulosic is gonna absorb it well. Wool absorbs dye well. You have to use it at a cooler temperature. And then we had um, nylon also absorbs uh, RIT dye very well. Others like polyester, there are some um, aspects of RIT dye that will dye polyester, but it will be a lighter color. And then I showed you those samples. Uh, how to wash dyed fabric. Cold water with light colors by itself because the color will generally bleed out a little, just like what they say, you get that. That used to not be so typical, but now almost anything you get, it says wash light colors together. <laughs> if it has been dried in the dryer, you can dry it in the dryer. Um, because that heat helps the dye stick to the cloth. So what equipment is needed? Uh, you know, we did a whole supply list of the, the big, the pot that you can put the medium or the water into, the um, heating device. We use both an electric kettle and a hot plate and the cup to dissolve the dye, the spoon to stir it, the mesh and nylon sieve to uh, the mesh over the, over the metal sieve so that you could um, filter out so that no, none of the dye particles were remaining. Because anytime you're using dye, you're using multiple colors. So you don't want to end up with 
like for this, it would be red and yellow. You don't want to end up with dots of color. You want to have a really nice uniform color like this one. Okay, really fun to do that, guys. Safety equipment. What are three kinds we use in the costume area? Mask. <laughs> yep. Mask, goggles, and gloves. Those are three we use. We use a smock to cover up not only our not only our clothing, but our skin. Remember that dye particles and other particles can go in. Your largest organ is your skin. And there's all these little dots that are hair follicles. And that's an airway into your body. So you want to make sure that you cover up your skin. And um, a couple of other major safety things that we use are adequate lighting so that we can actually see clearly. Um, we need to make sure our electrical is grounded and that we have enough power to operate all of the equipment like this, particularly when I was doing the both the electric kettle and the hot plate I had two different dedicated circuits for each because the, the hot plate takes a lot of power so an iron you know takes a certain amount of amps and I remember when we moved into this room and I told the uh, the set designer who was helping create all the power I said we need more power Oh, no, no, no. I said, when our machine turns on, when we hit turn on a power machine, this is this needs a five amp circuit dedicated. Irons take significant. Like you really don't want to plug in a steamer and an iron into the same receptacle because that could blow the, blow the circuit. So um, that is something that's very uh, important is your lighting, your ingress, egress, your electrical safety so that you're also being safe with your electrical and water. And when you're on location, you're often, you know, are you running, are they running the electrical cords through rain? You need to really be super aware of that kind of stuff. And then the personal safety items, PPE, we've had it for decades, mask, goggles, gloves, and then a smock of some kind. Um, if I'm doing a lot of dyeing, I even wear a Tyvek suit so that nothing actually comes in. Okay, this is just a, a question from about measurement. If you were going to say, uh, first of all, where is the waste? Remember how we discovered that? I'll back up here and show you. So the waste is really there's only one place the waste can be. And that is that place between the rib and the hip, which is the smallest part of the body. It's also the part of the body where you bend to the side because there's no bone here except for the skeleton that goes down the back. So the waste is that smallest part of the body between the hip bone, the lower part of the ridge, rib, and you can actually crease where you crease to the side. That is the natural waste. And I have to tell you, that is a really interesting thing to discuss with actors when they come in and they'll say, that is not my waist. I'll say, that's not where you wear your pants, but that is your waist. So the natural waste is something that is a very um, important part because that gives you a anchor against which you can measure the body from the top to the waist and from the waist to the knee or to the floor, but it gives you a way to on paper identify the three dimensionality of the human body. So if you were going to make shorts, what would you need as a requirement? What do you think, Cara? Waist measurements, length, uh, hip to thigh. That's it, you got it. You nailed it right on the first try. Waist because this is the place where it's gonna be anchored. Hip, which is the widest portion. So you wanna go right around the widest portion for the hip. And then how long are they going to be? Some people made their shorts mini. Some people like those shorts down to the knee. And you know, if you're making board shorts, you're putting them to the knee. So that's a, that's a personal preference, but you got it. Waist, hip, length. And same with a skirt, waist, hip, length. If you're making a skirt, same with long pants. So you know, measurements are work for a lot of different kinds of things. So it's good to think about it. Okay, know the basic machine stitches that we learned in class. 
So you guys have your sewing portfolios. If you get them turned in, I can give them back so that you can see that you've got your right, your stitches all together and that you're done them correctly. So our six hand sewing stitches, running or basting stitch, cross or cat stitch, back stitch, slip stitch, hemming stitch, locked hemming, um, are how to sew on a button, sew through button, leaving a thread shank or with a metal shank, knowing our basic sewing machine techniques, plain seam, welt seam, French seam and basted seam. And then what's the point of understitching? What's the point of the ruffle? Remember ruffle has a ratio. So it's the, it's the width of the fabric in relationship to the amount of fullness that you want. So it's a fullness ratio. One and a half means one to one would be flat. One and a half would be half again to create a small ruffle, double. You know, when you get into super full, you would have maybe three times fullness. Millinery, I'm just going down the list. What are the two biggest hat problems on stage? Light, the brim is shading the light, right? That we can't see the actor. They have to put the bright, so the light is hitting the brim so we can't see the actor and the actor's not keeping their chin up. So those are really the two major problems. You can make the brim in front shorter. We talked about that and have the longer brim to the side so that it appears to be a great big brimmed hat, but we cheat that, right? We're gonna cheat that. And we used um, the materials, the common materials we used were buckram and felt. We also talked about straw and that buckram is a cheap version of straw. How that we formed that, using the wetness of the buckram to form it over the, over the uh, whatever the hat shape was that we wanted, whether it was the crown or remember we made the crown of the derby and felt using steam. So both are really a water process and very, very safe. Millinery cleaning, how did we do that? We brushed it, we rolled it, and, uh, and then we shaped it with the um, steam. So those are the things that you need. Uh, four costume resource books, you can just look that up. Just think about, you know, history of costume or Vogue fashion magazines or anything like that. I mean, I think it's just a good idea. I put that question in there just so people will look something up. Um, the crew handbook, know the different steps of it. And it's so easy on our Canvas site because everything is there. So it starts with the costume shop personnel and the costume crew. I've given you a breakdown of the um, cross plot or action chart. What does the production calendar teach us? The itemized list for the character from a sketch, which I've given you an Antigone one. So let me go to the cross plot. Right, so that it tells you what what's the character name, the act and scene, and what's going to happen, and maybe a costume number, so that we maybe know how many changes or where it would happen. Um, how long should you allow for construction? Depends on how many people you have. Uh, so that's based on your calendar. And what is an item list? What does it do? So you want to indicate every every item that this person's wearing so that you are prepared for your fitting. And then in turn, if you use your item list correctly, you can create a budget from that and a procurement plan. So you know where you're gonna, or you're guessing where you're gonna get your garments. And then how to uh, measure. And we did a whole, this is a very funny picture. But we did, a, we talked about our measurement chart and you had the, the grid picture. For some people, that is the most important thing they learned in the whole class. Um, uh, how to organize a whole group of people. Cara, you'd be ready to do your, you'd be ready to design a play now. And, um, 
here's a here's a, an example of a change list. So if they're going from one costume to the next, if they're doing a, uh, you know, uh, this is another way to create the chart. It could be check in, check out based on the date, half slash for check in and make the X when it's check out. You've got a copy of that with Antigone. And then this is an indication of how to take care of the garment, wash, dry, dry clean, spray it, you know, and so forth. Um, what service does a rental chart, what does a rental house provide? Well, they, you know, they give you costumes and you pay for them. <laughs> so, you know, they have a wide variety of costumes available that are already prepared, which is nice. And then I have uploaded the rehearsal report form and the performance report form. And that's a way for us to keep track of what's going on in rehearsal without actually having to attend all the rehearsals because that would just be way too onerous. We don't have enough time to do that and get the class costumes created. So um, uh, different kinds of craft materials, buckram, cheesecloth, leather, pressed fiber, which we had in our non-woven sections such as um, felt. What does that do? Uh, we also talked about, um, you know, fake fur, uh, neoprene, and other kinds of things. So review those. Those are our non-woven tend to be more of our craft materials. Leather you can make not only hats, chaps, and armor out of, and then you can actually color it so it can look metallic. Um, paint, foam, uh, three-dimensional foam that you carve into shapes and know the scope of the costume crafts field. What kind of crafts are employ people? What do you, what kind of skills can you use to be employed? Sewing machine, you know, I got my first job at my costume shop in this with because I could sew and I got my first job on a movie because I could sew. Generally, those are really separate items, but if you're working non-union, you, then you can move into being a set costumer, then you can move into being a costume supervisor. So. Sewing is really an important thing. Fabric modification, my first job on a really professional TV show was because I did fabric modification. They give me big garbage bags here, make those look like they're used by humans instead of out of the store and then bring them back. So I'd get paid by the bag. Um, you know, shoemakers or cobblers to when we, for example, we had to do in a 1920s movie, we had, to, she had to try on brand new shoes. How do you figure that out? How to make those work? Uh, definitely shoemaker is a just an incredible skill and I, I don't, it's very hard to find a good one. Jewelry designers. So you can have jewelry made. And I had a great jewelry designer that when we went to Graceland, she made, we had a, um, I did a show called Grace Under Fire and we went to Graceland to actually do it. And she had these tiny little record platters and she made um, pins out of records for our waitress and then put our waitresses names under them. So all kinds of things that help you with the detail of the character. But armor makers, Adria Dyer, fabric modification, mostly, mostly just like creating the garment so it looks like it actually belongs to somebody instead of brand new. Milliner, everything that has to do with the hat. Of course, uh, wig and hair designers, not exactly in the, in the costume area unless you're in a play and then the costume designer has purvey over all of the from top to bottom. And then pattern makers, cutter, draper, fitter, uh, fabric ID people, fabric printing of fabric, stenciling, creating that and creating alternative fabrics by maybe putting two things together and maybe, maybe even braiding fabric together. So we've done all kinds of crazy things. So that's basically it. Um, anything, Car, that you have a question on uh, based on our review? Not so far. Okay. If I think of anything else, I'm going to, I'll review the exam today. And if there's something that is, um, that we did not cover, I will make sure that I note that. Okay. Otherwise we can be done early and you can start prepping for your makeup final.
All righty, I'll see you in a while. Yeah, and and I'm looking forward to seeing that Vegas version. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I think I'll just leave the the um, Zoom open if anybody comes late, but uh, that's the end of our review. So I'm going to stop the recording.